Um, I'm going to tell you a little, little story. It may not be your story, but it may have been your story. When you think about being a kid, I want you to go back to being a kid. Maybe it was great. Maybe it wasn't. But I know being a kid, there are times when when you thought things were going to happen that didn't happen. There are times when you really wanted people to be there for you, and they weren't. There are those times when you said, yeah, can you pick me up? And they were like, ah, oh, sure. And they were always late. Or maybe they just never came. They just never showed up. Or that, you know, that science project you, you were just so proud of, and, and you wanted them to, to be proud of it too. And were the soccer games, and they were just were too busy to come. You know, and then you, this is a pattern. And, and then, you know, to make up for it all, you know, they decide to take you some lame vacation, and you're at some crummy little, I don't know, Howard Johnson's with this pool, and you're standing there with your feet curled around that pool coping, looking down at the water, and there they are in the pool. And they're saying, jump, I'll catch you, I got you, go ahead, just, just jump. And something happens where you just freeze in your head. Because you're like, this is going to go one of two ways here. There's only two ways it's going to go. And right now, when I'm standing there, my whole body is screaming to go, but there's a lot of my head that's saying, nope. Come on, I'll catch you can either end up with, um, nope, you won't, because you never did. Maybe your experience is very different. Maybe it's more like, I know they'll catch me, because they always have. And at that point of decision, there's a point of decision where at that instant, you have reached a crisis of faith. A crisis of belief, I think, would be a better way of saying it. At that instant, you make a decision, and the decision isn't about you. It's not about your ability to swim. It's not that you have calculated your body mass, time, surface tension, you know, and... It's, it's not about how good your lessons were. It's not about how stupid you're going to look if you do or if you don't. What if I belly... No, there's one, one decision that is being made right at that point. And that is your opinion of the person in the pool who is telling you to jump. What you do from that point... Whatever your response is, is totally dependent on your opinion of the person who's telling you to jump. Now, maybe it's not your awesome dad who always caught you. Maybe it's some relative, you know, who came along on the trip or showed up for the day, and you barely know this cousin or this uncle or this whatever, you know, and they're like, come on, kid, jump. And you're like, uh, your name was what? No relationship, amen? No relationship. You're not going to throw yourself into the air into certain drowning death for somebody that you don't know. That there is no relationship between you and that person. 
comes down to whether you believe that person is going to catch you. And your response will be to do exactly what they told you if the answer is yes. So that gut-wrenching, really difficult moment, right, where you're standing on the edge and it's like, it's so stressed, you're so stressed, you have to make this decision. But that is all dictated by your opinion of the person who's calling you into the water. The last couple of weeks, Victor's been sharing about the ways that God speaks to us via the Holy Spirit. He uses the Bible. He uses, give me something else. What is it? He speaks through yeah, the church. He speaks through prayer, circumstances. So the whole point, oh, there's lots of ways that the Lord speaks to us. Um, there's a great book that says, uh, sometimes he sounds just like my wife. Come on, that's funny. That was funny. So all these points of contact is the creator speaking to you. And he uses all of these things so that you can hear him speak to you. And it's not about, you know, the, it, you want to hear his voice. Does anybody here want to hear the voice of God? Yeah, I mean, like, that's crazy. That's why you're here, right? Um, what an honor. What an honor that the creator of the heavens and the earth wants to speak to you. But then you have to say, well, what's the point? What is the point of God speaking to you? What's the very next thing about? So we're going to assume today that you have had an experience with God where you have heard his voice, be it through the scriptures, through prayer, through a circumstance, or through someone else sharing, through the, the sermons, or through a brother or a sister in Christ. You have heard, we're going to say that we have heard the voice of God. And today, what we're going to talk about is what comes next. Maybe you have heard what he wants for your life. Maybe you have big decisions to make. Maybe he, you've heard what he wants you to do. He wants you to do something. It doesn't have to be big. It could be, you know, small, medium, large. Somewhere he wants you to go. Someone he wants you to reach out to. It could be in any of these different ways. But any of these situations is God inviting you to join him in the work that he's already doing. Does that make sense? He wants you to be part of the work that he's doing. You've heard the call from the pool, and now you have to decide what to do next. So no matter the size of the task that we're talking about or that you're thinking about hopefully now, what we are talking about are God-inspired, God-willed assignments that he wants you to accomplish. But without his help, you will fail at them. So he's not asking you to do things that you can do without him. He, we're talking about things that you can't do without him, okay? Now, today is all about that turning point in following his will for your life. Henry Blackaby, in the book Experiencing God, he calls this point a turning point, the crisis of belief, which is a turning point. It's that fork in the road where we have to make a decision. Can, do you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Where you, you just can't stand there anymore. You have to pick, pick a road. You have to make a decision which way you're going to go. Now, in those situations, experience, when you're experiencing God in your life and you've heard his voice, it, in your life it's going to take a leap of faith that relies on him alone. Like I said, when you're standing there, you know, ready to, to jump in, you're not calculating body mass. You're, the whole point is, is, the, is he going to catch me? And that's what, this, that's what the walk with the Lord is all about. It's about whether or not, what is your opinion of your God? Is he going to catch you? 
So that word crisis that we're talking about, a crisis of belief isn't like, you know, oh, I'm in crisis, like some bad thing. It's just that point, that turning point where you have to make a decision. And how you respond to that invitation, how you respond, what kind of a decision you make totally tells you your opinion of your God. So in life, there are these huge points of decision, right? We've got huge points of decision like, you know, I don't know, be a missionary, don't be a missionary. You know, get married, don't get married, move, get a job. Um, so many big, big points. But you also know that life isn't made up of all just big points, big decisions. Life is made up of tens of thousands of little choices that we make. Can I get an amen on that? And I got to tell you, God wants to talk to you about all of them. He wants to talk to you about the big ones, but he also wants to talk to you about the little ones. He wants you to hear his voice in that whole relational concept. Folks, if you have a best friend or you've been married or, you know, you're close to anybody, you know it, it didn't happen by just one big decision. It took lots of small decisions that you made correctly in the context of that relationship so that you're close. The whole point of everything that we've been sharing is your relationship with God. It's how to get closer and closer to God, that he's at work in the world. He's inviting you to join him in this conversation, to join him in what he's already at work. He wants you to help. He wants your involvement. He wants what only you can bring to the table. So, Big things, small things. I want to talk about small ones just for a minute. He wants to talk about the daily, the small ones that we need to hear his voice about. I think we miss out on a lot of them because we don't ask. Because we're like, don't need help with this. You know, it's like, I got this. I got it. And then you end up saying, well, I got the next thing, the next thing. The next thing you know, you're totally self-reliant, and God isn't in your thinking any longer about your decisions, which stinks. But I'm going I'm to put you in a very difficult position here. Ready? Here's a little example. Imagine, if you will, you're in the grocery store. You're in the grocery store. You're heading down the cereal aisle, and oh, no. Somebody else is heading down the cereal aisle in your direction. <laughs> Crisis of belief. Right here, baby. Right here. We're in it. This is the real world. Crisis. Here's my choices. Do I become immediately concerned with the amount of Cheerios that have been manufactured? Or do I look that person in the eye... Look them in the eye and smile under my face mask. Okay? I've reached a crisis of belief. Now, let's break this down. Let's assume I have heard the voice of God regarding this situation. Yes. Where have I heard it? Well, where have I heard? I mean, did I actually have to go, Lord God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, should I smile? I don't think so, okay? Why? Because I already know the answer, don't I? Do you all know the answer? Okay, what, I'm going to give you a verse. Here's a verse. Be kind. Boom. Drop the whatever this thing is. You, you know, be kind. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, I don't think you need all of that at that point, because if you've got to forgive that person for coming the wrong way with the little arrow in Dave's, and you're like, mm, that's right, don't you be touching those chairs, because I'm going in the right direction and you're not. Well, then maybe we need to have more of these kind of conversations. <laughs> but let's just start with this part of the verse, be kind. Well, isn't it nice to smile at somebody? I think everybody deserves a smile from you, from me, right? So can I assume now that we have heard the voice of God about this, this crisis of belief? Either get involved with the cereal aisle 
or smile at that person or maybe start a conversation you know, while you're in line, right? You know, all of these, these are cr major crises. I understand it, but we've just broken it down. So do I know what the will of God is for this moment? Yes. What's the crisis? Whether I will respond to God's invitation to smile and be kind, say hello, start that conversation, or I can go my own direction and miss out on seeing him at work. Follow me? You may think that that was a very silly example, but it's one of those small daily points of decision that furthers his work and builds our trust relationship with him, or it continues to keep us as the boss of our own self-directed lives. Last night, my husband and I went out to dinner, and they sat us at a table and I didn't like the table. I just, just like, I don't know. No, wasn't feeling it, okay? And I'm a little picky. You would never know I'm a little pushy occasionally. So I was like, mm, honey, can we not sit here? There's some, there's some, and it was really full, and we were lucky to get that table. So I said, mm. they said, well, I've got spots at the bar. Okay, so we sat at the bar to have our dinner. And we ordered, and we're looking, and I, he said, that's, that's what's their names. And I'm like, we couldn't remember their names. We just knew they were what's their names. So I'm like, no, it's not what's their names. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm telling you it is. I'm like, wow, it really is. So I recognized him, and then I recognized her because her hair was different. And these are people that we had met at a different restaurant. You can tell we have this bar ministry, right? This is, and, and we had met them at a different restaurant and, and hit it off, and we're talking, and, you know, talk, like, talking about God, blah, 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 but, you know, nothing really heavy. So, so last night... We were invited into what God is already working into this couple's life. And we moved even from where we were at the bar to right next to them. <gasps> and I got to speak the gospel in a way on 40 years that I have seldom, if ever, been able to in this unbelievably... God set it up. If I told you the conversation, you'd be like, and they're not here today? You know what I mean? It was like just one of those. And the point isn't that they go to church. The point is that they go to God. I think, you know, maybe we'll see him someday. But the point was, was God was at work, and I had a choice to make. I was out. Oh, my gosh, I couldn't wait. Just Richard and I have been, like, going crazy since we've been home. And it was like, we just wanted some us time by ourselves no, nope. God had a different idea. Crisis of belief for us at that point. What are we going to do? What we wanted to do or what God wanted us to do? Does that make sense? And I'm so geeked about what happened last night. I'm like, I am closer with God, right, honey? It's like we're closer with God because we did that. And we saw him work and, and we were a part of what God and the Almighty is doing in somebody's life. Isn't that what you want? I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do and trying to see. So, you know, so, so much of life is crisis of belief time. When we choose which voice we're going to listen to. We're going to listen to our voice that says, ah, no, I really don't want to do that. Ah, I really don't have time. Ah, I'm really busy. Or are we going to listen to his voice? I mean, your voice says, you know what? Here's a good one, relationally. Your voice says, I want to argue about it. And then God's voice is forgive, okay? Your voice says, oh, let's take that money and put it into savings. God's voice says, give it away, okay? Your voice says, let's stay comfortable. God's voice is calling you out Beyond your comfort zone, your voice is, I need to stay quiet right now. I really, I just don't want to talk. And God's voice is, speak up. Speak up right now. Speak up. Who is telling the truth? And that's, your, that's what you have to decide. Who is telling the truth? Is the guy who's saying jump, 
Is he telling you the truth when he says he's going to catch you? Because if you believe him, what will you do? You will jump, you will speak, you will give, you will get involved, you will go into places that are uncomfortable, you will push into, to your own hurt, you understand? Because you know that that was the voice of God and you cannot but do what he says. To do otherwise is only to strengthen your opinion of yourself and to minimize your relationship with him. Because faith is obedience. Can you please say that to somebody? Faith is obedience. When God speaks, what he is asking requires faith. When God speaks, what he needs from you is faith to do something about what he said. Faith is obedience. You know, without it, can you please God? Wow. So he ain't messing around. In other words, if you want to please God, people, what is it going to require? Faith. It's going to require doing what he says to do. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? In other words, if you, you, know, if you break that down, what he's saying is, if you don't do what he says, he's not your Lord. So when Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him, we're living our whole lives trying to please God. Can I get an amen from my fellow, fellow pursuers, right? You know, it's like, well, how do you know if you got faith? I don't know. Did you get wet? Right? You know, a, a nice bathing suit. That didn't do it. Great little swimmy things you got there. Right? Mm, that doesn't say it. I just want to know, can you wring out your bathing suit? If it's still dry, mm, we, we got a problem. Do you understand that? If you're not living it, man, if you're not getting in there, if you're not jumping, if you're not getting wet, if you're not like, you know, dealing with your fear and your faith is getting better than your fear and all of a sudden you, you're doing stuff for God and when you do, that is what pleases him. It doesn't please, you know, you got a kid and you go clean your room and they go, yep. Is that, is that it? Is that good enough? Yep, no, I should. Thank you for telling me. Really appreciate that, Dad. That's a great idea. Man, that is great. I sure wish I could get up there and clean my room. I know that someday I will have the faith to do it. You know, and, and, and I'm going to tell other people that they should. Because there's nothing like a clean room. Or a clean garbage can, Victor. Um, you know, there's just like, this isn't doing it. What's doing it is for the kid to actually get up, walk up the steps, get into his house, you know, and, and, and do the job, right? That's what faith obedience does. The problem is we say to ourselves, I can't do it. I can't do it. Or I don't want to do it. That's not even possible. So as a result, if we keep telling ourselves this, that's the voice we're listening to, we're not going to do nothing. We're just going to keep relying on our inability instead of having our focus on his ability. Hear this. When God speaks, he always reveals what he is going to do. Not what he wants you to do for him. We are merely joining him in what he's already at work doing. You, you understand the difference? And then you're like, I don't, I don't think I get the difference there. The point is, you're not called to accomplish a task through your strength and your ingenuity and your limited resources. That isn't what we're talking about. A crisis of belief isn't the belief about you. And it's not what you believe about the task. It's what you believe about the God who's asking you to do it. And otherwise, 
If your focus is on God's ability to get it done and, and just going, yes, Lord, I'd like to be involved with that, then you can proceed confidently because you know he's going to do it. It's right back to the pool thing, man. Again, you're not going to calculate, you know, how, you, how you, whether your buoyancy is. You, right at that moment, you're going to calculate if God can catch you. It's none of this is about you. Does that make sense? And that kind of, I, I know that's a slight change maybe because I'm sitting here and saying you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that. But you need to be doing all of those things because God has told you that he's got you. Okay? You need to jump. Jesus says in Mark 10, 27, he says that with men, stuff's impossible. But with God, how much is? All things are possible with God. And as Christians, frankly, church, I would like to get past these crises of belief about whether or not we should smile at the person in the grocery store. Okay? I mean, really? Are we still dealing with that? Is that still like, oh man, what a day I had today. I had to be nice to two people. Gah, killed me. Oh, good thing I had the help of God. Couldn't have done that. No, no, really? Okay, hold on. Many believe that God would only ask you to do little, cool, small things. And I'm down with the small things. Some people think that God would never ask them to do impossible things, difficult things, things that would really stretch them or make them uncomfortable. They think that God would never even lead a church to attempt something that it couldn't afford. Oh, we have to look at our budget and only work within our budget. Really? That doesn't take faith. Amen? You know, oh, well, you know, I don't want to do this because, you know, then I'd have to. Well, that doesn't take faith. Folks, you might think that it's not loving for God to ask you to do difficult things. It's the most loving thing he could possibly do because that's where you meet him. That's where you see him. Consider this. The fact is that when you accomplish things that only God's help can explain it, what a witness you provide for his very existence in your own life and the people around you that see it. The, anybody, Sarah, so glad you do what you do with the coats and all that stuff. You don't have to be a Christian to do that. Amen? You know, people, are, are there people who are nice to other people? You know, I mean, do, do people save the whales? You know what I mean? Do they, do they help out at homeless shelters? Are they kind? You know, can, do you have to be a Christian to do those things? <laughs> no, you don't. If, look, if you look at the ridiculous, huge things that have been done in the Bible throughout time, Moses parts the Red Sea. Abraham becomes a father at, you know, like 5,026 years old. Whatever. Joshua, the walls of Jericho come down. If you look at all of these things, what we're seeing, we see things happen that only God can do. And when only God can do it, everybody sees him, not you. That's where I want to get in my own life. You know what I mean? Because otherwise, every, you know, it's like when we bring coats, that's great. And people are going to go, gosh, those are such nice people. That church, they're so faithful. You know, they just, they're always there. They always bring stuff. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying that that's not necessarily God. That could just be us. And I would love for us to get past just us. Think about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? They're, you know, they tossed in the fiery furnace and they didn't fry. You don't bow, you don't burn. What happens when they come out? The king, this was a God thing. That was not a thing like, hey, we wore the right clothes for that. You know, they were fire retardant. You know, no, 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 no. This was obviously, you know, there's another in the fire, right? Taking care of them. And when they get out of that situation... What does the king do? He's like, okay, we ain't never seen nothing like that before. I declare this God of them is the only God. And if you don't like that, we're going to tear you limb from limb and, you know, burn your houses down. Uh, so, you know, it was a motivational 
circumstance there. It, but the whole world of that time heard about this God, of, that there is no other God than that God. That's what happens when big things, when you say, you know what, yes, I'm going to smile, but I'm also going to ask God to let me be part of something like that. Getting out of a boat and walking, let's do that. How about, you know, the Red Sea? The Red Sea thing? That was cool because here's what the verse says. It says that Israel saw the great power of the Lord. The church will see the great power of the Lord when one person here says, you know what? I'm going to have the faith to step out onto the water. I'm going to have the faith, you know, the, and, and it's what I want. I want people to know God. Will they know God because we give them a coat and a meal? Yes. But I think that we have too low of an opinion of what God is inviting us to do for him. God wants to make his love and his power known. In the smile and the forgiveness, yes. But also in the patient enduring of trials, Yes. And in the generosity of your life? Yes. But also in the God-sized, unexplainable, miraculous happenings through people that, like you and I, that just cannot be rationalized any other way than there is a God in heaven. And that's the God that we serve. Folks, God needs somebody that's going to fight the giant. God needs a David who is going to, you know, he's a kid and Goliath's nine feet tall. And is there anything at stake here? Yeah. Loser nation becomes slave to winner nation, okay? So it didn't just affect David. It affected the entire nation. That crisis of faith right there for him. God is saying, jump, David, jump. And he's going, you know what he says, though? Here's what he says. He rehearses the God who saved me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He is going to take this uncircumcised Philistine and he, we're going to win this. He rehearsed all that God had already done, right? It's like, oh yeah, of course I'm going to jump because he's always caught me. Your God has always caught you. He has always caught you, people. And if you think otherwise, you need to revisit those circumstances because I don't think the problem was with him. Amen? Amen. Might have been you, might have been somebody else. But if we would rehearse it, then in our head, then when we're said, you know, told to jump, it's not going to be this huge crisis of faith, crisis of belief, where we can't handle it. You can do it because he can do it and always has done it for you. If you read Hebrews 11, which I suggest you do, it's the hall of fame of faith, of people who did miraculous things. You know, they just, they've stopped lions, they've, you know, delivered armies and, you know, done all kinds of things. And some of them, you know, some of them went really well. And for some, it didn't work out that well. And I want to bring this up because every time you get involved with God doesn't mean that you're going to be happy about it. It doesn't mean that, that it's all going to work out really well. But I will tell you what it, what it will do. Hebrews tells us that of all of these folks that heard the voice of God in their life, and chose to jump. It says that they all obtained a good report from God. Folks, well done thou good and faithful servant. Isn't, isn't that what, that's all you want? Isn't that why you do what you do? So in this life you may not be rewarded in human terms, but this life is very short and eternity is where you want to be rewarded. And to obtain a good report are those who, by faith, did all of these amazing things. It's our turn, church. They had their shot. Now we got ours. It's our turn. It is your time to join him. 
It is your chance to get involved. And it's your time to jump. Our ultimate model is Jesus. Because Jesus, oh boy, says that we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, folks. Let's get rid of whatever is keeping us on the edge of the pool. Let's, let's get rid of whatever is keeping us from, from really just jumping all in, especially the sins that do so easily beset us. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And how do we do this? By keeping our eyes on the one who always said, yes, Lord, I'm coming in. I'm going to join you in the pool. Always the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, obtaining that good report, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. And I just want to leave you with this thought that says that a place of honor awaits each and every person who will take God at his word and who will conquer their fear and jump in. Because you know you've got a faithful God who has always been there and always will be there. Lord, speak to us today. Speak to us. And then I ask, Father, that you would increase our faith to not just hear what you have to say, but to judge you faithful. Lord, may our opinion of you grow so that when you ask things of us, we just say, yes, Lord, how high. We will jump at the chance to be involved with what you are doing in the world today. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a chance, a turn, a time, a shot. Through Jesus Christ, amen.